uh, for a welcome, by the way. Thank you all for staying for this after the service. And for those who have just arrived and perhaps weren't here for the service, my name is Randy Hollerith, and I'm the dean of the cathedral. And it's an honor and a pleasure for us to have the Senator John Danforth with us today as our preacher and to um, have this conversation. Uh, I would like to share with you just a little bit about the senator from the bio that we put in the bulletin this morning. But in case you didn't see that, as I mentioned during the announcements, he has had numerous titles and um, has been a great blessing to many in our country for quite a long time. The Reverend John C. Danforth, see we're in the church so I get to start with that. The Reverend John C. Danforth graduated from Princeton University, Yale Divinity School, whoop, 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 we put a special kick in there for that, and Yale Law School. He practiced law in New York City and St. Louis before serving as Attorney General of Missouri, three terms in the U.S. Senate, and as the U.S. Ambassador to the United Nations. An ordained Episcopal priest, Senator Danforth is the author, author of numerous books and the founder of the John C. Danforth Center on Religion and Politics at Washington University in St. Louis. Will you join with me in welcoming John Danforth to the cathedral? So you, uh, you have written about this in your book, but tell everyone a little bit about uh, your journey from uh, seminary to law school to the Senate and how that all came about. Let me first say that if you're wondering why the cane, I broke my ankle bull riding in a rodeo. <laughs> <laughs> no, I slept in a shower. But the moral of the story is don't take showers, right? Um, well, thanks a lot, Randy. Thank you for your hospitality. This is such a... Um, great cathedral and great center of really the relationship between religion and politics. Uh, my story is as follows. When I was about 10 or 11 years old, uh, my father took my brother and me to Washington to see the sights, and we sat in the Senate di uh, gallery, and I thought to myself, I want to do that someday. And my dad, on the way out of the gallery, said, what a, what a bunch of windbags. So <laughs> uh, I wanted to be in politics, and I wanted to be a lawyer, but I majored in religion in college. And I believed, I'm not sure I could call it a call, but um, I believed that I should go to Yale Divinity School and um, follow up on what at least seemed to be an interest. And I wasn't there very long before I realized that I was just not cut out for the parish ministry. It's, it is a real calling and it is so important and it takes a special kind of person to do it and I was not that special kind of person. It, it would have been an outrage to tell you the truth for me to be in the parish ministry. So I switched to law school and uh, but I, while I was there, I was able to finish the two degrees at the same time. I went to the dean of Yale Divinity School and said, would it be okay if I could just take enough courses in the Divinity School over the three years in law school so I could finish my divinity degree? And the dean, a man named Liston Pope, said, well, that's an interesting combination, being both a lawyer and a ministry. It's like being a striptease saint, but I'll... I will let you do it. So that's what happened. And then I practiced law. And uh, when I was pretty young, I was 32 when I was first elected to public office. I was elected state attorney general. Did that for two terms, eight years. And then I went to the Senate for um, three terms there, 18 years. And then I went back into private life. It was very important for me to go home. To be, and I, somebody told me there are only three ways to leave the Senate. Two have to do with boxes, and you don't want either of those. But I did it voluntarily, and uh, I thought it was the right thing to do. That's great. I'll have to remember that one. 
We have a wonderful program here at the cathedral that we got kicked underway last year. We call it Honest to God, and we bring together um, generally three speakers at one time, folks of um, social note, uh, either in government or in the wider culture, who are people of faith, different faiths perhaps, to talk about how their faith has influenced their leadership, how they found that bubbling up for them in, in their um, in their greater calling in the work that they do. Um, so I'm going to imagine that you're one of our participants for the Honest to God series and just ask you, how, how do you think your faith, um, that major in religion, your time in seminary, your ordination, how do you think that has a, that affected or, or worked its way through your, um, your all your years of service in government? Well, uh, let me say what it, what it is not or was, was not. Um, there was not, say, when I was voting on the Senate floor, it wasn't, I am God's own representative in the United States Senate voting God's power in the Senate. I think that would have been wrong, vain, pretentious, even sinful. Um, but I am what I am, you know, and I, I am a believing Christian and a practicing Christian, and it's, it is who I am. So I think it relates to everything I do. I don't think that my religion is something that's just one hour a week type of a deal. I do think it pertains to who I am. And um, how does it affect how I think about politics? I think that it's really important to know that, um, as Isaiah said, my ways are not your ways, says the Lord. My thoughts are not your thoughts. That, that a, a, a very healthy dose of humility is part of how to approach everything, but particularly the political life. And I think when religion becomes really a bother, and it does, it can be very, very divisive. It's when people believe that, that their religion translates directly into political positions, which I don't think it does. You have a wonderful quote in uh, your book, The Relevance of Religion, which I, I recommend to you if you haven't had a chance to see it. You write, and if you'll um, pardon me here for quoting um, several sentences, while it's important to measure all that I do, including my politics, against the demands of my faith, I have found it difficult to draw straight lines between the creeds I believe and the policies I support. On the contrary, I am convinced that the sanctification of my political opinions would amount to idolatry that would render it impossible to compromise with others. Yeah, well, that's, you know, that's how I feel. I mean, I think that politics has to be the world of compromise. It, it has to be the world of sausage making. It has to be less than perfect. It, it is, politics is only politics. And to make it something else, you know, Paul Tillich, Paul Tillich used the expression ultimate concern. The great 19th, 20th century theologian talked about ultimate concern, identifying religion with ultimate concern. Well, there can only be one ultimate, and that is God. And the ultimate cannot be anything political or else you are you know, at best, ridiculous, but at worst, you just make politics totally, totally, totally unworkable. And I, so, you know, I, it, when you're in it, actually, when you're in it, it's very easy. I kind of mentioned this in the sermon. It's very easy when you're up close to politics, and particularly when you're actually in it, to blow it out of all proportion and to think that everybody in the world is hanging on whatever you're doing in politics. In fact, they're not. They're going about their lives. 
in one little thing that happened to me in one of my elections, my first re-election to the Senate, I came very, very close to losing. It was a really a close election. Terrible year, 1982. Terrible year for Republicans. And I hung on by the skin of my teeth, fortunately. But I was, in the last couple of weeks, I was kind of a nervous wreck. And my then 15-year-old daughter, Dee Dee, tried to comfort me by saying, well, it's not the World Series. And, and, <laughs> and it's true. Politics is not the World Series, and it certainly is not religion. I see increasingly in our culture today, and have experienced some of it myself in events around the uh, cathedral, that there are times, and it seems increasingly in our life together today, that, and as you spoke of in your, in your sermon, that we are so divided as a nation and that we tend to, um, increasingly to demonize one another on the other side of the aisle. It's almost gone from being, I think I'm right and I think you're mistaken, from being, I think you're evil. And um, I think that's a, a, a very, once that starts, I think that's a very hard uh, notion to counter um, when we head that way, as opposed to seeing that each of us is this beloved child of God. And I wonder if you'd comment a little bit on that. Um, so people often ask me, do I miss it, you know? I mean, I left here in uh, 1994, and I loved it when I did it. I loved it when I was in the Senate. I thought it was really an interesting, exciting place to be. And I would, I'd hate it today. I would just absolutely hate it. I don't know why anybody would want to be there, to tell you the truth. I don't think they do anything except take positions and make speeches and try to get on TV shows and try to get, get themselves elected. And, but politics was, what the Senate was, was a place where all different points of view were represented, different interests, strongly held interests. It wasn't, as they say, beanbag. It was, it was, they were hotly contested. But eventually, bills became laws through the process of working through the committees, amendments, amendments on the floor, <laughs> conference committees with the House on legislation. And it, it was all a matter of just working things out. That, that's a very modest view of government. It's, it's not perfection. I have put in place my perfect policies, which I'm going to press upon the nation. It wasn't that. It was... It was a it was sausage, it really was. It was kind of a mess, but it was a mess that we consciously created, that our, the framers are, of our Constitution cons consciously created a structure which would produce some kind of result based on um, checks and balances and based on all different kind of opinions being thrown together and people trying to work things out. That was our constitutional system and it's broken down right now. It really does not work at all and Congress does not work at all and the United States Senate does not work at all. So when you go to school, you know, you used to see there was this little show, how does a bill become a law? Well, bills don't become laws. Don't, they don't. And we've lost something if we, if we don't have a place where all these conflicting, strongly conflicting interests kind of get in one place and try to come out with some result. In your sermon, you talked about the need for us as uh, Christians to to really live into the world and our loving our neighbor as a sort of an antidote for some of this. Uh, you are my friend, which I thought was a wonderful thing to share. But before we go there, do you think um, from your point of view of your experience of what it was like and what it's like now, 
uh, what has structurally changed? I mean, I've heard it's everything from the fact that earmarks went away and that they were somehow the currency that made deals happen and compromise happen to the fact that no one lives in Washington any longer and or the fact that people are on the campaign trail, you know, as soon as they hit their, their office. What, what kind of structural changes do you think have taken place that so have brought I, this I about? I think people not, families not living here, that's a very big deal because it's very important to know people, whether they're you know, your allies or your opponents, know them as human beings. That means being in their homes, it means knowing their families. And that was when I said I wrote this piece about Tom Eagleton, who for my first 10 years in the Senate, he was my colleague. We were very different. He's, he, was, he was a Democrat, I a Republican. He was very progressive. I'm more conservative. We, were, we had real differences, and yet we were friends. You know, when I was on the on the evening, on the night after I was first sworn in in the Senate, we had a little family party, and very some very close friends and family were at the party, and Tom and Barbara Eagleton were there, and I didn't know him very well at that point. Knew him, knew him a little bit, but not very well. And during a quiet time that evening, he turned to me and he said, I know you wish your father were alive. And that set the tone. It was humanity. And I think that that's gone. And I don't know, I mean, I'm sure a lot of people have commented on what's the reason for the change. It's, I believe that it has to do with social media. I believe that it has to do with 24-hour news channels on TV, I think that they're awful. But I think it also has to do with the base of each party being so unforgiving and, um, and demanding that you just be an absolute purist. I'm planning next month, I, most, let's say in my family, um, the political gene is recessive. <laughs> but I do have, I do, one of my grand, grandsons has sort of an interest in it. So I said, okay, let's hit the road and we're going to get in the car and we're going to take a couple of days and we're going down in the southern part of our state, which is very, a uh, colorful place, very enjoyable place to be. We're going to just tour, we're going to be in the boot heel, which is very southern, and then we're going to go over in the Ozarks, which is very kind of country, and we'll just have a good time and we'll tell stories and, and, and so on and so forth. So I called a friend of mine who lives in Cassville. Everybody here knows Cassville, right? <laughs> well, this guy is named David Cole, and he's a good guy, and he lives in Cassville, and he's a lawyer. And I said, look, I'm going to be there with my grandson. I'm going to be with my grandson, and, and we're going to have a good time. And but can we stop by Cassville and spend a little time, and can you figure out maybe some stuff we can do when we're in the Ozarks? And he said to me, well, he said, yes, I'm happy to do that. But he said, I'm running for the state senate as a Republican. And I said to him, with me, because let's say my style of republicanism is now out of favor, putting it mildly, I said, if you're going to be with me in the Ozarks and you're running for the state senate, you better wear a disguise. I mean, I'm going to ruin you. But this is, I think, what's happened. It's there's kind of been, it's become joyless and rigid and unforgiving. And what happens to people who want to stay in elective office, they're going to be primaried. That's the new verb. They're going to be primaried unless they're just absolutely all the way for their the current party. 
position. So it's a big, it's a big change. Um, in your book, uh, you talk about, uh, I thought these were very helpful, uh, four fundamental concepts that faithful people, regardless of their political party, should be able to agree on. I won't make you recite them, I'll read them. <laughs> so, <laughs> uh, that politics needs to remain in its proper place. It's not the realm of absolute truth or the battleground of good and evil. That we should be advocates for the common good. That we should be a uni unifying force working to bind America together. And that we should advocate political compromise and make the case that the spirit of compromise is consistent with our faith. I thought those were four um, really wonderful points, and I'd love for you to comment on them in any way you'd like to, but especially about how the spirit of compromise is consistent with our faith. Okay, let me start with the third one, which, which um, has to do with un unifying, is that what A it unifying is? force. Yeah. I, I believe that the I believe that the main principle in our country is simply holding ourselves together. That's what I think. I think holding together in one country all these different kinds of people, all these different kinds of people. So the concept the Constitution starts, we the people, right? With how to create a people, how to hold together a people. In those days, we had a small country, three, four million people, something like that. We did have differences for sure, slavery being a, the biggest of them all. But it was a small country. Now we've got, we've got, you know, a hundred times as many people and we've got all these different interests and all these different points of view. And how do you keep them all together? Just how do you keep us together? And I think that when you think about those various points, one is humility, modesty, knowing that you know your way is not, not God's way. And the other is knowing that you're only gonna be able to keep people together on political issues if you can compromise. Otherwise, it's gonna be stalemate, which is the situation right now, or it's gonna be, and also with the way it is now, just name calling, and, you know, just outrage, just total rage all the time. So, you know, it's, it, it all sort of fits together and under the concept of e pluribus unum, you know, we, we, have a goal of keeping together all these different people and different interests. In the, in the Gospels, Jesus not only meets with the Pharisees and the Sadducees and has conversations and meals with them, but he has meals with tax collectors and, as Scripture says, notorious sinners and things like that. So he a, has a wide group of people that he gathers with. But there are things within the Gospels that um, um, Jesus uh, calls us, we're kind of called to stand up for, whether justice or, or peace or equality among human beings. And where does the spirit of compromise, where does that run up against the, uh, or how does that run up against the call of the gospel at times? Right, I mean, if we had, there is, in our faith, there is, the prophetic tradition. And it's very, very important. The reading from Amos today was kind of typical of the prophetic tradition. And it is the prophets of ancient Israel speaking for God and condemning injustice and condemning oppression. And it's, it's very, very much a part of our tradition. But as I tried to say, you know, in, in, in the sermon, standing for 
and this is one thing that I think has happened these days, standing for justice, as the prophets did, standing in the prophetic tradition does not give you license to make your point by singling out an individual and saying that's an evil person or saying that person is a racist, as happened with the uh, Ferguson police officers. How did they know that? I mean, I know that the clergy felt very strongly about speaking out against injustice. Good, I'm glad they did. But to pick out some soul that you don't know and humiliate that person in public with the TV cameras rolling. I just think that that's wrong. And I think we, have, we are doing that today. I think it's a strategy. I think you're seeing it on college campuses. I think you're seeing it in political campaigns of making your point by picking on people. And um, so that, that's a, just a concern I have. So in this day and age of stalemate, when we're so divided, um, when there is such isolation as you point out, and it's interesting, I used um, some of the same statistics in a sermon that I preached just a couple of weeks before about loneliness, um, not only in the United States, but especially in Great Britain, talked about both. Um, as you look at those things, I, I love to ask people that we have these conversations with, and, I, and you gave us a broad scope, but uh, do you have anything, any ideas of what should a place like this cathedral be doing, um, given what you talked about? What should be the role of an of a institution like the National Cathedral? Well, I think that you should... As I said, I don't have any blueprint for you, you know? I mean, I don't, you'd have to figure it out yourself, and all of us do have to figure it out ourselves. But in a country that's fractured and that's politically fractured, how do you heal that fracture? How do we, be, how do we conduct in this place a healing ministry? How do we do that? Do we do that by sort of having people just arguing with each other and in each other's faces? I mean, I am, I think that the prophetic ministry, which is getting in the faces of people, everybody's in everybody's face today. Is, is this the right time for us to be just in people's faces? Uh, I think that a more pastoral approach is, is today's ministry of the church. And I think trying to recognize, trying to build wholeness and try to hold the country together. And I, how to do it? I think you could do it. I do believe you could do it. I mean, we were talking before the service about your predecessor, a man named Charles Perry. So we had some service, I don't even remember what it was about, but he had all these religious groups, you know, in here in this cathedral. And they, like Harry Krishnas and all these people, and people beating drums and all this. And I kind of turned to him and said, hey, what's, what's happening? And he said, well, this is a house of prayer for all people. That's what our banner says, we're a house of prayer for all people. But well, we're a house of prayer for all these religious groups, which we should be. Why can't we be a house of prayer for all these political groups too? Why can't we make it a point to be welcoming to these people and figuring out ways to get them together? I mean, wouldn't it be a neat thing if instead of two chairs here, there were three? And you would be in one chair, and you'd have um, some, you know, 
Republican stalwart and some Democrat stalwart, and you would start out asking them as you did about me, what's your life? Tell me about yourself. I think that would be just a neat thing to do. So I think there are all kinds of opportunities to bring people together. Thank you. Thank you. I appreciate that. And we are working in those directions. That's a big part of our strategic plan. So um, I'm glad to hear that. We won't take some time for some questions for folks who are out there. We have a few minutes left. So if you'd like to ask uh, Senator Danforth a question, just raise your hand and we'll come to you with a microphone. Don't be shy. Thank you, Senator and Randy. Um, I th I'm trying to be as positive as I can on this subject about division. And in my lifetime, I haven't seen this much division since the 60s. Vietnam, the civil rights, and what I want to suggest is that sometimes you got to get really to the bottom where things look so hopeless, and that may be a vehicle for change, along with Martin Luther King and Lyndon Baines Johnson. I think we are down in that, uh, in a terrible time right now, and I'm hoping that we're going to see some leaders that are going to grab a hold of what your message is and, and, uh, and, and basically save the country. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Do we have a question for the senator? Over here. Great. I think that in the spirit of um, Elizabeth Warren, who uh, said, I'll invite a constituent to have a beer or dinner with me. In that spirit, I think the politicians can also come to us. We are in the field. We are people. How do you see that possibility intersecting with what you suggested, having different political factions sitting side by side in dialogue as the cathedral already has had various religious and spiritual groups coming together. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Well, uh, one of the examples that I gave from the Amy Chua book was from um, Hackettstown, New Jersey after the last election where people on both sides got together just to be with each other and they called, they had their slogan was make America relate again. I mean, that was just, who knows how or, who organized it, but somebody did. It just took a little bit of initiative of getting people together. There are examples of doing it. One of the examples I use in one of my books is has to do with my hometown of St. Louis and how the, the head of the number one leader, president, chairman, whatever, of Missouri Citizens for Life, a wonderful woman named Loretta Wagner, and the, the head of the abortion clinic in St. Louis became friends. And they just started having meals together and their families getting together. And they never agreed on the subject of abortion, for sure, but they found out there were some specific things that they could do together. For example, in the case of one very, very, very young, like 11-year-old girl who became pregnant, working out adoption and working out health care for her, that kind of a thing. So there are th some things, if you try to do it, you can do it. 
It takes local initiative. I don't think you're going to have, I can't do it. You know, I can't just say, okay, here's the plan for, say, somebody in Washington or somebody in, you know, in Cleveland or wherever, I, I don't know. You'll just, you have to be nimble enough to figure it out, but I think you can figure it out. Can I hold it? Oh, you want to hold it? Okay. Okay. Hi, my name is Sugata Robert Cooper. I'm a native Washingtonian and a product of the Episcopal Church in the National Cathedral. And I got talked into being involved in the political system. And my parents were architects. Uh, Kent Cooper Architect uh, did uh, diocesan retreat centers, many churches, many things. But how do you deal with the evil, the real evil, that the senators and congressmen are subjected to, the blackmail. I was talking about 9-11. When they take anthrax in Fort Detrick and poison the Senate, how do you deal with that kind of evil? Um, I honestly, I, I wouldn't dwell on it because I think it's not representative of where most people are. I mean, the entire time that I was in public office, that was 26 years of it, there were very few examples of real corruption. Very few. There was one case of a senator who, in that Abscam scandal, if you remember that, who w was, I guess, voted out or forced out. Not much, really. And in my state, well, we just had the county supervisor in my county, county was convicted of crime. He's out of office happens it's it's not that it doesn't exist at all but it's not the real deal it's not representative and i think it's it's sort of like well what it, what i said about the ferguson the police officers you either presume that people you're dealing with are good people and you try to evoke that goodness or you can presume that they're bad people and just blast them. But I think now we're over, overdoing the blasting and underdoing the presumption that most people aren't just evil souls. Some are. Prosecute them. But as a political strategy or a political method, I don't think it's a good idea to just assume that people are just bad, evil. They're not. How about one more question? Uh, Senator, the dean has asked my question, that is to say, what role, if any, does this cathedral have in helping to bring us together to ameliorate some of these problems uh, that you express so vividly in your sermon and you've articulated in further detail uh, on the platform now. I happen to think the cathedral has some kind of role and it's not local. It could be national and it could be influential. We've got to get a hold of ourselves and uh, people of faith are, couldn't be in the forefront of this, as you said in your sermon. And this place is not just a local institution. This place is where important national and international issues come together and its influence can be con consequential. And I hope this is something that, with everything else that the staff and the dean has to do here, that we can, we can address. Thank you very much. I appreciate what you said. Well, thank you. And, and yes, I, I definitely think that. I definitely agree. I mean, I don't think that this is a place to battle out so what should be in a tax bill or something like that. 
but I think, but I do think occasions will, you'll think of them. I'll tell you just an example. So back in the day when I was in the Senate and Randy's predecessor, Charles Perry, was the, I guess he was called provost of the cathedral anyway. He was the same job, really. And he was really, he, I'd think stuff up. And the cathedral became the place. We had, so we, I introduced a legislation in the past Congress, not, it wasn't a heavy lift, but it was to memorialize the Holocaust annually. The Holocaust. You talk about evil. To memorialize the Holocaust, to keep it before us. It's supposed to happen one day, one weekend a year. Do you know where the first service to do that was? Here. It was in this cathedral. It was an interfaith service in this cathedral about the Holocaust. It's terrific. Think of the role that this cathedral has in great national moments, disasters, 9-11, presidential funerals. I had the honor of, of having preaching at Reagan, the Ronald Reagan's funeral here. It was a great coming together of a country here. This, this place was the epicenter of coming together as a country. This place. Sometimes occasions will arise. President will die, something 9-11. Sometimes, like the Holocaust, you'll just see it and grab it. But yes, it should be. This place, this place should be as I say, the epicenter, the, this place should be the heart, the center of just what I was talking about. If, if we believe that it is our religious commission to be peacemakers, then what, there's no better place than this to do it. So thanks a lot. Thank you. Senator, I can't thank you enough for coming and being with us um, today. It's a pleasure to have you back in this cathedral and to have your voice amongst us again. And uh, God bless you. Thank, thank you. you very much. Thank you all very much.